please be seated. May these words be spoken and heard in the power of love. Almost lost my text, it's all right. So we've probably all heard the expression, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And of course it's not just beauty which is in the eye of the beholder, but all kinds of ways in which we value something or someone or some place really varies from person to person. It'll vary perhaps from culture to culture and often it'll change over time. So things we might once have valued as a community or as individuals or as a family might no longer be as important to us and so on. All three of our readings today and the, the Sunday readings are not chosen because they intersect with each other. They're not exactly random, but they're selections from three different tracks. But every now and then there is a degree of convergence between them. And in the, today there's a little bit of convergence in that each of them, to some extent, are about um, what are we looking at? What are we, what are we valuing? What, what value are we placing on the person or the situation in front of us? In the Gospel last week, we had that kind of strange story where both Jesus' family, his mother and his brothers and sisters, and, and also the religion experts from Jerusalem, we might say from the cathedral, had come down to Capernaum because they both thought Jesus had gone nuts. Well, they all thought Jesus had gone nuts and was getting a bit excitable about this religion stuff and should just basically come home and have some of mum's cooking for a while. So in that story, Jesus turns on the experts and, and threatens them. If, if they're too blind to see God at work in front of their eyes, there's no way to help them. So again, it's another take on that idea of beauty, value, significance is, is in the eye of the beholder. We build on that theme a little bit today. So we've got three stories. We've got Samuel going to Bethlehem. We'll come back to that in a sec. We've got Paul writing uh, perhaps fairly late in his life to the folk in Corinth. And then we've got the parable of the mustard seed. And Kathy has actually brought in a mustard seed uh, from, a, from a program. She was on one time. So if you catch up with uh, little Kathy later on, because there are two Kathys next to each other, but everybody in Grafton knows little Kathy. Um, that's, that's, her. that's how we all know her. Catch up with Kathy with a little pink beret and she's got her mustard seed there which I'm sure will be delighted to show you later on. So let's come back to Samuel. Samuel is a crusty old prophet getting on um, priest and so on in the life of ancient Israel around about a thousand BC. He's getting towards the end of his life and he's, he himself as a young boy was overlooked by his predecessor a crusty old priest called Eli. He couldn't imagine that God might be talking through this child. So he's heading off to Bethlehem because he's on a, um, a fairly delicate mission. He's formed the view that God is finished with Saul, the first king of Israel, who Samuel had appointed, and that um, God has sent him off to find somebody else to take over. Now that's not the kind of thing that you publicize, okay? It's a kind of undercover operation. And Samuel is going to Bethlehem basically to get involved in the politics of dynastic change. So it's no Christmas story, even though it's a story of somebody going to Bethlehem. And it has, you know, Bethlehem, we go, oh, Christmas time. No, no, same town, very different story. And it, as, as this kind of story, so he, he heads, into Beth, heads to Bethlehem, he's going, he's already done a bit of research ahead of time, and he's, he's wanting to find the family of Jesse, the guy from Bethlehem, because he's got a whole pile of sons, and one of them, he's been told in his prayers or whatever, one of those boys is the one you are to anoint. Now, as this kind of story, of course, requires, turns out, Jesse has lots of sons. So they set up this kind of fake event so the police won't get suspicious. I love the idea that Samuel takes a heifer and walks all the way from Ramallah to Bethlehem leading the heifer. 
sure he could have bought one when he got to town. But anyway, here he is walking through the hills of Judea, leading this calf, who's then going to be because put on the barbecue. The proud father presents seven of his sons, one after the other. Okay, and we heard the first three of them got named. Mercifully, the story writer decided not to make us read out every single one of those names that we find a bit more tricky. And Samuel's pretty impressed that this little voice in the back of his head's going, nope, nope, that's not the one, that's not the one. And there's even a verse that says, don't look at their appearance. God's interested in their heart. Okay, again, beauty, significance, value in the eye of the beholder. Eventually they've gone through seven of these impressive young men from Bethlehem. And Samuel says, you got any other sons? Like, these are pretty impressive guys, but is there anyone else? Oh yeah, yeah I mean, there's David, but like, he's just a kid and he's out looking after the sheep. He's probably goats, actually. But you know, he's out, he's out in the dirt and the dust looking after the animals. Well, we know how the story has to end, of course. The little kid, the youngest kid, the overlooked kid, gets brought in, um, maybe not even time to scrub up, presented to Samuel who says, this is the one, and then pours a, 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 a horn full of olive oil all over the kid's head. Yuck, okay? But that's the moment when David is anointed as the chosen one. That's where we get the word anointed, indeed the word Christ comes from that idea of being anointed with oil as the chosen one. And that, by the way, is a really good example of a Bible story as being true on all sorts of levels, even if they never happened that way. You know, the overlooked son, I have three younger siblings. Each of them feels that I'm privileged because I'm the firstborn son, you know, blah, blah, blah. But you know, the, those dynamics in families of the younger one, me too, me too, what about me? So there's a, Samuel is learning to look differently and not to overlook, and maybe Jesse is learning not to overlook the little one. When Paul is writing to the Corinthians in that passage we heard read earlier, he mentions almost in passing that once upon a time he looked at Jesus from a human point of view, but he doesn't do that any longer. And again, that idea of how we look, what's our perspective? How are we looking at someone? And it's certainly, uh, certainly possible to look at Jesus from a human point of view. Lots of people do that, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And people who will ch never, ever choose to become Christians, followers of Jesus, can still get a great deal of insight in, and wisdom for living by paying attention to Jesus. But Paul says... I've learned to look at Jesus from another perspective. I've come to appreciate him as the risen Lord, the one who's always with us through his spirit and the one through whom God is changing everything. He goes on to say just the tail bit of that reading in the next couple of sentences. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See... Everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. So that's Paul writing, yeah, maybe round about 56, 57, the common era. How we look at Jesus, whether we look at Jesus, is our choice. But if we look at him through the lens of faith, then everything changes. So as we go by Sawyer, one of the questions for us as parents, godparents, extended family, cathedral family is how do we want Sawyer to see Jesus? What kind of faith formation are we going to be giving him? 
And then there's the mustard seed. And I'll resist the temptation to go and steal Kathy's mustard seed. Um, another story about how we look determines what we see. Now the parable of the mustard seed is, is one, of the, one of the few things out of the Gospels we can be absolutely sure that Jesus said, even though the four or five different versions of this parable already show us people beginning to interpret it in different ways. For most people, uh, this is a story about something that starts out really small, mustard seed, and then becomes this amazingly huge tree. And I'm reminded, I was reminded initially of, the, of that TV ad with the jingle from Little Things, Big Things Grow, which of course is a protest song about the land rights campaign way back in the 1960s. Um, from Little Things, Big Things Grow. That's how most people through most of history have understood that parable. And if you see it that way, you'll be in a large crowd of people, but Jesus may not be there. I'm a little bit arrogant sometimes, okay? So, what, so it depends how we look at this parable. What's it about? Most likely, when Jesus first told that parable, and he probably said it more than once, like he didn't just say something once and then go to the next village to think of something brand new. He was probably saying this stuff over and over again. He may have had in mind the idea of smallness, which for many people means insignificance. But Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. What can we compare the kingdom of God like? And he's saying, it's like a mustard seed. It's like, it's like the size of the head of a pin. It's a tiny little thing. He's not talking about big things growing from little things. He's saying, do you imagine God's kingdom as something powerful and loud, or do you imagine God's kingdom as something small and easy to overlook, easy to ignore? Because it's just tiny. There's nothing impressive about it. He may have been thinking of what happens in the fields when mustard seed goes wild, which it did and still does, and it becomes a kind of a, a haven for the vermin and the birds that like to hang around the edge of the field and pinch the farmer's food and the crop as soon as it begins to flower, as soon as it begins to mature. The farmers, of course, would wish the vermin and the little animals and the birds would go somewhere else. But so is Jesus saying, so how do you imagine the kingdom of God? Is it like a neat and tidy and proper thing? Or is it that, that scrappy hedge where all the vermin and the little animals and the birds hang out and find shelter? And there's something else about mustard seeds, and you can see this when you're driving even today through the parts of Galilee. I, I like to compare it with nutgrass, except nutgrass stays in our turf and the mustard bush goes everywhere. It's a bush about this high, and it, it just runs wild. I guess when I was a kid growing up in Lismore, I would have compared it with Lantana. If you don't keep chopping it back, it spreads everywhere. It takes over the paddock. It might seem like something you can overlook, but if you don't notice it's there, and if you don't stay on top of it, it'll get away from you. It'll take over everything. That says Jesus, is what God's rule is like. It's not big and noisy and impressive. It's not interested in purity. Everybody comes. That's why we say, as the priest holds up the bread, holy things for holy people, broken things for broken people. There's no purity test to come to church, although often that's not the message we've given. And if we once begin to give God a bit of space in our lives, then God will take over and permeate every aspect of our life. So how do we imagine God? Big, powerful, noisy, possible to ignore, or small but pervasive, gathering up the people we tend to overlook and building communities of hope in a world that runs on fear. And how do we see Jesus? 
and how might we imagine the church in the years to come as we pick up the pieces and rebuild after all the failures and things that have gone wrong in past decades? Are we hoping once again that the cathedral will become a powerful institution in Grafton and that all the business people in Prince Street will want to be on parish council like they were 40, 50 years ago? Okay. Is that the kind of church we want? A big and powerful institution that everybody pays attention to? Or a place which is small but inclusive and transformative? Might that be the kind of church we're looking for? And how are we going to teach Sawyer to look at things as his life goes on? Amen. <laughs>